Okay, so what I want to do now is, uh, it's a timely time. Uh, we've uh, sort of covered five chapters in Chan, and we've done all the things that it turns out have to do with an equilibrium sort of plasma, a well-behaved one that's not unstable. And so it's a good time to kind of summarize where, we, where we've gone. And so what I want to do is just, in a very cursory way, uh, give a sort of summary of the course to date. Uh, sort of as a review of all the pieces that we've, we've uh, talked about. So the first thing that we talked about um, in uh, the so-called introduction was basically Debye shielding and what was a plasma. So in particular, let me just say, uh, what did we have as the definition of a plasma? Well, what it is is it's a, I'll, I'll say it and then write it, a quasi-neutral gas of charged and neutral particles which exhibits collective behavior. That's the reason why we get into all these oscillations. Uh, rather than just single two-particle collision behavior. So a quasi-neutral <coughs> gas uh, of charged, it's not going to last very long, and neutral um, particles, which exhibits collective behavior as opposed to single particle, two particle collisions only behavior. And what we uh, well, I, I want to make a couple other comments. Uh, we had as criteria for the existence of a plasma that, in fact, we had to have first that the system was very large compared to the Debye length, uh, at least in bulk, so that we could have quasi-neutrality. So let's say quasi-neutrality. Secondly, we had to have a large number of particles in a Debye sphere, and this is basically for collective interactions of all those particles in the Debye sphere. Interactions. Um, a third criterion we had was that omega tau be much greater than one, and this what this meant was weak collisional, the tau is one over nu here, so this is weak collisional effects compared to collective effects. And that's, of course, automatically guaranteed if uh, we have Coulomb collisions, but with neutrals it gets a little bit more uh, complicated. We also, remember, sort of had that, suppose I have uh, a whole bunch of, uh, I'll make them red particles today, whole bunch of charged particles here, and if we pick out one test particle and say how is it affected by all the rest of the particles, what we found is, say, if there's a test particle here, that I should, in fact, draw a distance, sort of a Debye length, away from that, and all the particles within a Debye length, uh, it's labeled so we can see it, uh, all the particles within a Debye length somewhat, uh, interact with this particle simultaneously, but outside the potential of the Coulomb potential of that one particle is shielded. In particular, we plotted the potential at a distance r away from the um, charge, and whereas the Coulomb potential would have come down just as 1 over r squared, the Debye shielded potential came down as 1 over r, and then at about the distance of the order of the Debye length, we basically had a collective interaction or polarization of the medium uh, over distances long compared to the Debye length. So inside distances shorter than the Debye length, we see bare particles, if you wish, Coulomb potentials. Outside, they're Debye shielded. Particles don't feel each other experience forces over distances long compared to that. So this was sort of just 
definition of a plasma, Debye length, and that sort of thing. Next subject we went into then was the subject of single particle motions. And here we were saying let's not yet worry about fluctuations or anything like that. Let's just try to figure out what happens to single particles as they move around. And an electric field is quite easy. They just respond, you know, F equals MA acceleration. But what we were mostly interested in was with a magnetic field. And for that, we found that the average of the Lorentz force, Q V cross B, was equal to some force on the guiding center of a particle, which in fact was minus mu grad B, the mu grad B force, where mu was the magnetic moment of the particle because it was gyrating around the field line, V perp squared over 2B. Then what we found was that um, parallel to B, we basically had free streaming, and our equation of motion just became m dv parallel by dt. The mass times acceleration is affected by the parallel electric field, and then by mu del parallel b for this mu grad b force, the parallel to the magnetic field component of it. Perpendicular to B, we had two parts, basically. Namely, we had gyro motion, for which we can write sort of x perp is equal to rho, which is uh, v perp over omega c, and then some unit vector, say, in the x direction, times uh, cosine omega c t, plus phi, and then, uh, the, then you have the one in the y direction, the other direction, plus y hat sine of omega c t plus phi. But in addition, we had the perpendicular drift velocity, v drift perp, which was the most interesting and easiest one was the e cross b drift, which said that you apply an electric field and you in fact drift in an orthogonal direction to both E and B. Uh, but then also because we had this guiding center drift and magnetic field curvature, we had 1 over QB squared and then B cross the various forces, namely mu grad B uh, and curvature drift MV parallel squared uh, B dot del B which is the curvature force, and then an acceleration term, or an inertia term, m d v drift by dt. Now, um, mostly we're in low beta approximations, uh, so what we do is we approximate this as grad b over b. And then um, for so this approximation is for low beta pressure ratio of plasma pressure to magnetic field pressure. Um, and in that case, then we can approximate all of this by E cross B over B squared plus one over omega C and then V parallel v parallel squared plus v perp squared over 2, uh, and then b cross gradient b over b squared plus the pole. So this is the parallel squared part is the originally the curvature drift. This is the grad b drift. And the last thing I'm going to write down is the so-called polarization drift, 1 over omega c d by dt of e perp over b. Now, so this was our, our main um, particle orbits, but you remember we also talked about the fact that, in fact, there's time scales that are going on here and various things that are going on on various time scales. And those were basically time 
let's call it time and length scales, and action variables. And the first was gyro motion. And that was at rate, you know, omega sub c, which is the um, gyro frequency and gyro radius. And then there was this constant mu magnetic moment, mv perp squared over 2b, which is in fact uh, px, dx, where x is the distance perpendicular to the field line. Um, then next we had bounce motion. Um, then next we had bounce motion, and that was the bounce frequency, and you move sort of some distance L parallel, and there's an action angle for that, which is J, which is the integral um, dL V parallel. And again, these are all action variables, and so they're adiabatic constants. And finally, we had uh, drift motion, slowest, and that's characterized by some drift frequency. You move some distance in what I call theta, and the action angle variable is the amount of magnetic flux you encompass by that, beta d alpha, and that's equal to some constant. So using these uh, ideas, you remember if we had a magnetic field line here, or, or uh, field structure, let's put it that way, with some curvature to it, the idea was that the particle, and, and maybe I need to really um, neck down the particles, but anyway, uh, the idea was that, that what you do is you gyrate around the field line and you bounce back and forth. So this is the gyration, and then you go back and forth like this, and this part is the, is the bounce, it's the parallel, and then the drift is in this direction, perpendicular, and the first part, the little bits here, are the gyro motion. And this is sort of nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds for typical laboratory type plasmas. But it depends a lot on the exact plasma you're interested in. Okay, so our, that took care of orbits to some extent. Our next uh, subject was basically uh, plasmas as fluids. Um, so this was uh, three plasmas as fluids. Um, and here, what we found out was that uh, in order to treat these things, what we had to do was a combination of Maxwell's equations, which I won't bother to write down, uh, plus two fluid density and conservation uh, equations, so two fluid equations, which, of course, were just density continuity, dn dt plus del dot nv is equal to zero, and momentum conservation, mn dv dt, is equal to nq e plus v cross b, and then depending on how we carried away we get, minus gradient of pressure, and then maybe plus frictional force, Coulomb, collisional frictional force. Also, we found out that a dielectric constant is only meaningful uh, for time-varying fields. So E goes like E to the minus I omega T, and so what we tended to label things as was that we had a perpendicular dielectric constant with a hat over it to tell us that it was a frequency response dielectric constant. Um, what we also found was that the polarization drift, polarization drift, um, led to uh, epsilon perp of omega. Um, in the limit that omega is small compared to the cyclotron frequency of approximately equal to epsilon naught 
times 1 plus c squared over v alpha n squared. And uh, our v alpha n uh, was equal to just b over root mu naught rho mass. And I can see I forgot to put one thing up here on my equation of state, equations of state. Namely, I need a d by dt of p over rho mass to the 5 thirds, or gamma, uh, is equal to 0. Now, um, parallel to the magnetic field, uh, what we found, uh, or, oh, well, sorry, first I started out with perpendicular here. So perpendicular to the magnetic field, we solved basically the momentum balance equation. And what we found was that the perpendicular flow was just the E cross B flow, both of the particles and of the fluid as a whole, and the diamagnetic flow, P cross gradient pressure um, divided by N Q B squared. And this translated into a perpendicular current. And if you add, you know, multiply by N Q sum over species, E cross B says the electrons and ions move together, so they cause no net current whereas the diamagnetic current does. And so what we found was this is equal to uh, B cross del PE plus PI, had to sum the species there, over B squared. And this current does not really represent motion of particles, guiding centers. Rather, you remember, it's just due to the inhomogeneity of the density of guiding centers. But you can calculate it from the drift orbits, but you also have to add the curl of the magnetization having to do with the fact that the all particles are acting like little magnets because they're gyrating around the field lines. So a second aspect of the um, par or, 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 with respect to the magnetic field and the plasmas as a fluid is that parallel to the magnetic field, what we have is that uh, we have an equation, the parallel momentum balance equation, uh, dv parallel dt is q over m uh, e parallel minus, usually we write it as gamma t, gamma t m n del parallel n. And this leads to, for gamma equals 1, our adiabatic response, n is equal to n naught in, in equilibrium and omega small compared to whatever processes is, are going on here, which is kind of a thermal bounce motion, it turns out. Uh, so this is then uh, E phi over T. Um, bolts, uh, and this is sometimes called the um, adiabatic or Boltzmann response. Now, the other thing we got into in talking about plasmas as a fluid is that the divergence of E is indeed rho Q, the charge density over epsilon naught, but that we should always be careful to realize that that's 1 over epsilon naught of the uh, free charge density indeed, but the biggest part that we have to deal with is actually the polarization charge density because as we move particles around, the, pol the medium is very collective, very polarizable. And so what we end up doing is often setting effectively rho polarization is zero is equal to zero uh, to get um, this um, E not uh, divergence of E is equal to stuff. Um, so that's the so-called uh, plasma approximation. Okay, um, then we went on to uh, waves in plasmas. Uh, so waves in plasmas. And basically these are linearized small signal response, you know, uh, of the medium. And we, we say everything goes like e to the i k dot x minus i omega t. Um, we had things like the phase velocity was equal to omega over k, and the group velocity is equal to partial of omega with respect to k. Um, our steps 
in this uh, in this process of getting waves, <clears throat> we're first uh, take our Maxwell's equations plus some sort of fluid equations. Um, you know, just write those down. And then our next step was to linearize them for small perturbations about the equilibrium, namely density is equal to n naught plus n tilde, take only linear terms. And the third uh, step was assume a wave-like response. Namely, n tilde is of order uh, uh, e to the i k dot x minus i omega t, <clears throat> like I wrote up above. And our basic, so this was a sort of standard prescription we worked through for a number of uh, types of oscillations. Our type of, uh, basic types of modes, if we had most typically uh, fluid electrons and uh, neutralizing immobile ions, so let's just say immobile ions, um, what we found was that if we had electrostatic oscillations, We just had omega squared is equal to omega pe squared, which is n naught e e squared over m sub e epsilon naught. And uh, we had some handy dandy formulas with that. And if we added plus thermal motion, we then had omega squared is equal to omega pe squared plus three halves k squared v thermal e squared. And then if we had electromagnetic, then we got light waves, c squared, k squared, omega squared is equal to c squared, k squared. But then we also had the plasma frequency as a minimum sort of frequency. On the other hand, if we had adiabatic electrons and fluid ions, then we got omega squared was either k squared v sound squared if uh, we had k lambda to by electron much less than one or omega pi squared if we had k lambda to by electron much less than one but k lambda to by i much greater than one which requires te much greater than ti it turns out. Now, some other uh, sort of general properties that we got into there um, were that we had the so-called index of refraction of waves moving through a medium. And what that is is n is equal to ck over omega equal to c over the, velocity, the phase velocity. And we talked about and used... Um, cutoffs, and that was the point at which the index of refraction goes to zero, which implies, just looking at the preceding relation, that k goes to zero. And then finally, we had resonance, uh, where n goes to infinity, and at that point, k, uh, this implies, uh, actually, k goes to infinity. And then uh, perhaps I should just go back here to say uh, more complicated uh, with a magnetic field. Okay, now... Um, Namely, let me just uh, put that down here. Namely, you get omega squared is equal to omega PE squared plus omega CE squared. That's the so-called upper hybrid wave or the intermediate uh, lower hybrid wave, omega CE, omega CI, or alternatively, you get K V alphane uh, for the alphane uh, speeds. Okay, the final thing we talked about was basically transport. Transport. 
So it was uh, diffusion and resistivity. And basically, we just used the fluid equations to address this. And if we had no B field, then we found that we had an electrical conductivity, J is equal to sigma E, Ohm's law electrical conductivity, that sigma was equal to N sub E, E squared over M sub E epsilon naught. And there's a, a factor here which had to do with whether or not you have electron, electron, electron ion collisions and stuff like that. And uh, E field builds up um, to give gamma E equals gamma I, net ambipolar, uh, net ambipolar flux. And in contrast, if we had a, magnet, a magne, uh, magnetic field and we had a magnetized plasma, for which we meant that omega C tau was much greater than 1, then as we've discussed, what we find is that the parallel diffusion rate is sort of like the collision frequency times the mean free pass squared, whereas the perpendicular is like the collision frequency times the gyro radius squared. And this had some special conditions relative to a fully ionized plasma. So this has been sort of a rather cursory and somewhat fast here at the end summary of sort of what we've tried to put together as the picture of a plasma uh, before it becomes unstable, where it exhibits even more interesting motions that we'll talk about next time.